Greetings, brethren. It's a wonderful day to be here with each and every one of you. It's nice to not have it raining as we come in today. We're all probably a little swamped as it goes. <clears throat> so, often we uh, are blessed by the youth here providing us with various skits sometimes. They'll, they'll come up and do a, a live Bible story, if you will. We know it's not perfect to what was, was done in the past, mind you, but, but nonetheless, those, those productions are very, very enjoyable to me and my family, I know for sure, especially the, the three youngers that like to participate in them. And if you notice, the, the children, as they're preparing for these events, They'll be very busy during and after church for the weeks coming up before it, even to the point normally the Sabbath before they kick us out and, uh, and come over up here and we'll, we'll put something together. If, uh, if you all have ever participated in any stage productions, or which I never participated in any stage productions, but I, was, I participated in a lot of music recitals when I was younger, um, we never did it dry if you will. Every event that uh, my parents made me participate in, uh, we did a rehearsal. Just like the kids do here, if you've ever been in a stage production, it's rehearse, rehearse, and rehearse. Today, I'm going to talk about the rehearsal that we're all being a part of now. God has called each of us individually to his salvation that yet awaits. God has not poured out his salvation yet. We are hoping towards that promise. Many of us are holding on to that salvation knowing full well what comes. But it, eternal life has not been granted to me yet. It comes with Christ. I have not heard, well done, my good and faithful servant, yet. So why is God calling us now? We recognize in his plan that he will reach everyone. Well, you individually have been called for a special purpose. You've been called now for your own good, for the good of those around you, and for God's glory. God is teaching us now through this rehearsal so that we can teach others later. So in our time here in the flesh, in this existence, in this rehearsal, what are we supposed to be learning? And it's not just memorized lines. We can memorize this whole book, and if we don't grasp the meaning behind it, we're no different than the pages that the words are written on. It's just paper. And we are, are the same if we are not applying these words appropriately. So what should we be learning here as we rehearse? A couple of things that I want to explore today. First off, we should be learning Christ's example. We should be learning his ways and following his commandments. As well, considering what awaits us in the hereafter, and it's not just floating on clouds with a, with a stringed instrument, <clears throat> we also should be learning how to judge appropriately. And I'll get into that later in the message. A day comes that we are going to be changed. This is a rehearsal, mind you, but we don't have the costumes yet. We have, we have a semblance of what comes. We can see what the scripture says, but there's a change coming where the costumes that are, are being prepared for us now will be provided. Let's read a few scriptures that talk about that. We'll start in Romans chapter 8. I think it's important for us to consider what we're being changed into so that we can give some thought to this rehearsal. There's, there's no point in working towards that if we can't envision what it is. And granted, it's going to be better than we can even envision, but at least with what's been revealed, we should be giving it consideration. Start in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
There's a key. The carnal mind is an enmity against God, and it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if, it, and if so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, and if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also arise your mortal body by his Spirit, brethren. <clears throat> we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. As many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption or sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, and if so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <clears throat> I wanted to read through that section there, and then let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and read a, a shorter section. Of course, the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is, is a chapter of great hope and an incredible vision of the plan of God for mankind, especially his first fruits. But I'll start in verse 51. I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but like I said, we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet, and the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to start here in uh, verse 13. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. If we believe Christ died and rose again, even so, those which sleep in Christ, he will bring with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which remain alive and at his coming shall not precede those who are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are living are alive and remain, shall be caught up together them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And of course, I like that last verse in 18, comfort one another with these words. This is talking about the change. Even in Job, he recognized that, that the change was coming in Job 14 and verse 14. Here Job says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my time will I wait till my change comes. So a major costume change occurs at Christ's return. And, and we need to recognize that, that that is where we're moving towards. We have not achieved that yet. But our purpose here is to be working towards that. As I mentioned earlier, we need to be learning about Jesus Christ. He set the standard. How we are to live with him in the future is how we are to live now. Granted, we have this flesh that, that constrains us, but he has called us to his glory. He has called us out of this world to change in our flesh and then from our flesh. God did not call us to just, to just get drug along through this life so that down the road things can be better. That's for everyone else. He put his name on your heart to seek him or you wouldn't even be sitting here right now. Your purpose is not the same as the rest of the world. 
Your purpose is to serve him now and later. Turn to 2 Peter. In verse 3. I'm going to start in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to to repentance. So, first off, when we consider one of the standards by which we need to be living now, this verse matters. This verse matters a whole lot right here. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some, but is long suffering, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Is that your perspective? When we look at the world around us, are there any that you don't want to have salvation? If so, that's a a serious issue that you need to do some soul searching about. It's the mind of Christ who wants all to be a part of his kingdom. He recognizes that not everyone will be, but right here, he wants all. So verse 10 says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up then. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, where the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for these things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Verse 11 there says, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be? He's not talking about what we ought to be in the future. He's telling us now that we should be living as godly and holy of a life as is possible. As I mentioned earlier, our our calling is such that not only should we be living a right way now, we should be learning so that we can teach others, both now and in the the future age to come. In Galatians 3 and verse 24, and I'm not going to go there right now, You can look that up yourself, and and that's a large section of Scripture, mind you. We are told that the law of God in the Old Testament was a school teacher. Now, the other Scriptures around that have been used by some to say that we are no longer under that law, and we are not under the consequences of that law, but that law remains in effect. The the sacrifices have changed, the temple worship has changed, but the laws of God, the commandments of God, have not changed, and they remain a teacher to bring us to Christ. In my own personal faith walk, I was raised in in a church system that had very strict guidelines and strong adherence to various principles of the Old Testament, and even though Christ was mentioned, there was not a strong focus on him. It was through my own life, through trying to figure out what those laws meant to me that I found Christ. Conversely, I have met others who have found Christ in their life and their love for God has taught them to go seek his law, to go seek his truth, to go find out what obedience means. We can't live this life just loving God and not doing anything about it. If I just loved God, I'd be sitting at home right now and I don't need to come see you guys. I don't need to be here. There's no point in fellowship. It's a, it's a matter of collective unity. It's a matter of coming together. It's a matter of creating a family as God is intending to do, and we can't do that by ourselves. That, that old law and that old covenant is a teacher. It does bring us to Christ. It only showed Christ. When I look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, the entirety of that collection of writings and prophecies and, and law, they all point to one thing, and that's the amazing Christ. They all point to, to the healing of this earth and to the redemption to the Holy Father who has only been revealed to us through his son, through Christ. I was, 
I was taught, like many others, and maybe not even directly as a child, that the, the Old Testament God was the father, the big, not real nice guy and not real forgiving guy, but I was taught wrong. That's not true. The plan of salvation exists clearly in the Old Testament, and our founding fathers of the church with Christ, that was their only set of records. And he was saying, this is me, this is me, this is me. All these scriptures, I'm, I'm the one they were pointing towards. That's what Christ said the whole time. And again, that was the only scriptures they had. <clears throat> Let's turn to, to Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15, here in verse 4, it says, Whatever things were written before our time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures would have hope. And in this section of Scripture, that's referring to the Old Testament. The things written before our time in the Old Testament, we're there for our learning. They're there for our education. Those stories are not without merit just because they're on the other side of Matthew. They hold a lot of value because they lay the foundation for the books Matthew through Revelation and hereafter as well. Let's turn to 1 John 5. Of course, 1 John 4 is, holds some of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible. Because in verse 8, as it says, He that does not know God, or he, he that does not love does not know God, for God is love. Which I believe is the most important lens to look through every section of scripture, every element of faith, every person who speaks the name of God. We need to look at it through that lens of God is love. So if, if something is coming at us and it is not love, it is not of God. Now, that does not mean that there are no consequences for bad behavior. The, the consequences of jumping off a building are gravity, and I, I can't avoid that. And even Christ said, don't tempt the Lord your God whenever Satan tempted him to jump off the building. And of course, when Satan tempted him to jump off the building, where's love in that? There was not love, yet he was throwing scriptures. We can, we can use this Bible inappropriately. We can use the Word of God inappropriately if we don't apply it with love. Because without love, again, it's just words on the page. But here in, in chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. One, one example of a commandment that I know everyone here has an has a affinity towards is obviously that fourth commandment, which is, is the Sabbath. I think it's interesting when I look at, at Deuteronomy, there's a, there's a verse here in uh, chapter 5. Actually, a sec section of verses, but in Deuteronomy 5, which is another recitation of the, the Ten Commandments, Starting in verse 12, it says, Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, and your main servant, manservant, nor your ox nor your donkey or any cattle nor any stranger in your gates, and that your manservant and your maidservant may rest as well. Here's the point I want to bring out. Remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out through a mighty hand by a stretched out arm, and therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So often I have heard people say the Sabbath is a burden, keeping the Ten Commandments are a burden. We just read in 1 John that his commandments are not burdensome. But I think this section here reminds us that even the Sabbath is a remembrance of the freedom from bondage. It makes no sense whatsoever for, for Paul or anyone else to say, well, the Sabbath is a burden, whenever right here, the Sabbath is a reminder of the freedom from slavery that we were given through the exodus from Egypt and now through Christ's sacrifice, that bondage of death that we all deserve through the old covenant that Christ fulfilled. 
He fulfilled the death penalty for us. He did not do away with the Sabbath. He did not do away with the first or second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth commandment. They were not done away with. They exist. They will exist. In Revelation, we have a vision of the temple. And it talks about the Ark of the Covenant being in that temple. And the Ark of the Covenant holds the Ten Commandments. It holds Aaron's rod that budded. It holds a bowl of manna. It has not, it has, all that has changed is the sacrifice. In Romans 7.12, Paul says the law is holy. In verse 22 of Romans 7, Paul also says, I delight in the law of, the God, of God. When we look at, at these commandments that Christ followed, that we have been commanded to follow, how do we look at them? Are we looking at them like, oh, it's the Sabbath again, I can't work, I have to go to church. Or it's the Sabbath, thank God I'm not working, and I can go to church. I get to go to church. I hope that when, when you wake up in the morning and you anticipate coming and being with people in communion with God and the Holy Spirit amongst us dwelling in peace, I love this church. And I am, I am blessed beyond measure that God guided my family to you folk. Every one of you. I'm so blessed beyond measure and I'm glad to be here. But on the converse... For the same thing. I could, I could be here doing the same thing and have a different mindset about it. And you wouldn't even know. Similarly, how are we approaching God? Is, is His Word in front of us as we read it, as it convicts us in our lives, whenever we start making decisions that might be adverse to His way, and we, when we hear that still, small voice saying, No, Mark, that's not my way. Do we, do we fight against that? Or do we yield peacefully and praise his name for teaching us? Because like I said before, this is the rehearsal. We are to be learning so that we can teach others. God's way is not just for me to consume and hide. There's a parable about that. It's for me to have and share to grow. It's for development. <clears throat> I want to read through a couple of, of sections of Scripture in Isaiah that, uh, that talk about the hereafter. Isaiah chapter 30. This is a, a section of Scripture... That is, that is talking about the, the beautiful future that awaits us where God, after Christ has returned. It says, For the people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem. There, they shall weep no more, and he will be very gracious unto you. I'm starting in verse 19. And when gracious unto you at the voice of your cry, and when he shall hear it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, Yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner any more, but your eyes shall see your teachers. As I understand the scriptures, when I read this next verse here in verse 21, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. I've been taught, and I believe it, that a day comes that the rest of the world is not just going to be floundering out there having to listen hard to God's word. When Satan is put away and, and Christ rules on this earth for that thousand years, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be ministering with him with the same powers of him. And I see this right here saying that we are going to be telling people, you're about to make the wrong move, don't. Because as we know in, in chapter 11 of, of Isaiah, which is another millennial section of scripture, Chapter 11 and verse 9, it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's, there's no place for sin in the age to come. There's no place for unholiness. 
it will not exist. And the sinful aspects of our character cannot transcend from this flesh into the spirit that awaits us with Christ's return. We should be trying very hard now to remove those elements of our flesh from our being as much as possible. We're still stuck in our skin. Don't get me wrong. Your skin is going to torment you until you are separated from it. There's, there, is no, there is no physical way to avoid our flesh now. It's not going to work. But what we need to do is we need to stop dwelling in our flesh, in our mind. Sure, we have to take care of our physical needs. We have to eat. We have to sleep. But whenever our flesh pushes us in a direction or causes a thought that is improper, which is how Satan works against us, he uses our flesh against us, we have to remember that those things go away and arrest it, bringing into captivity every thought to Christ. Your mind is a holy place with God in your life. I believe that when, when the temple, the, the inner court of the temple and the, the Holy of Holies, when that, when that curtain was ripped at Christ's death and the Holy Spirit came down to the apostles and his disciples on, on that first Pentecost, that the Holy of Holies changed from that place that was a physical place into the mind of anyone who would accept Christ and live his way. We are the temple. We know that. I've talked about that. And so therefore, the Holy of Holies is our minds. Where else can God dwell within us except for our thoughts? Are we keeping our thoughts in tune with him? Are we living a way that that allows our thoughts to, to, one, recognize when sin is entering our lives, and two, recognizing when God is calling us to serve others. Because he does. <clears throat> if you live your life and at no point feel convicted to help someone else or, or share a positive word from Scripture or, or through a sentiment of Christ, it's... If, if you're not convicted to help others, that means that something in yourself needs to get cleared out because the point is to magnify God's glory. The end of his, there shall be no end to his kingdom. It will only grow. And our duty here is to, to show a semblance of it now. It's going to expand mightily upon his return. There's going to be so much shown upon his return. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're the little bits of light and salt out there shining some of his glory through whenever we can get our flesh out of the way and let his spirit shine through us. Not for my glory, not for your glory, but for the benefit of others and for his glory especially. <clears throat> As we move through this life, how hard are we working to help others so that they don't stumble? So that our own life experience, I'm, I'm sure that... Every, between all of us in this room, we have all done some really stupid things that others could learn from. And when we see people walking down those paths, hey, come back, come back, come back, and stop them before they run into that brick wall that I have some scars from. You know, like, you don't know anything, well, let me show you the scars. Or at least let me tell you what, what happened. And good does not come from doing evil. So in... In one aspect, like I mentioned, we need to, we need to follow Christ. We need to, to learn Christ's way. We need to meditate and think on how would Christ handle this. The old, what would Jesus do? Eh, you know, he'd do the right thing. I, don't, I, I do not fully comprehend Christ's mind because I'm in the flesh. I, I know I will someday. So am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the thing that the Holy Spirit is urging me to do? Because that's the point, is to guide, to help, to comfort. So am I letting the Holy Spirit work in my life? Am I listening to it? It's not the loud, screaming voice. It's the still, small voice. So as we learn to be like Christ, one of the things that Christ will do, as we know through the, the book of Revelation, is, is he's coming for judgment. And, and as I talk about judgment here, I want, to, I want to clarify it very clearly at the beginning. Judgment is not bad, inherently. We have been conditioned through the society we live in, to believe that all judgment is bad. 
if any of you have ever been in a courtroom and received a positive outcome, you would not consider that judgment to be bad. I've been in those courtrooms. I have received positive outcomes from the judge, and it was not bad. It was judgment, but it was not bad. We have to consider, too, that when Christ comes to judge, He's also judging good. And those of us that are... And, and when the Father comes and we're covered with Christ's blood and with Christ's sacrifice, that's what's being judged against us. So it means that that, that judgment that is coming is, is bringing blessings for those that, that follow God and that, that will follow His way. Judgment can also mean bad things. Don't get me wrong. I mean, and He's also bringing judgment upon those that refuse to yield. As a Christian, we do have a job to judge while we're here. But you need to be very careful about how you do so. The first thing to consider with judgment as a Christian is that there is only one true, righteous judge, and it is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. That is it. It is not me. It is not you. There is not a man on this earth that can render the perfect judgment of our Savior. The reason our Savior's judgment is so sure is because it's not earthly judgment. It's heavenly judgment. You and I cannot judge people's hearts, whereas Christ can. And, that's, and, I, and I thank Him because He knows my heart and my hands don't always do what my heart wants. So I appreciate Him, him looking at my heart because I, I, make, I make decisions that are foolish sometimes where I think I'm doing the right thing for Him only to kind of look at the outcome and realize, no, no, that was... That was me putting my, my own mind and my own ego ahead of what I thought his ways were. In Acts 15, verse 7. And when there had been much disputing... Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bears them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did to us. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, we, don't tear, uh, we won't turn there again as well, but it, right there it says God knows the hearts. And I think that's an important thing for us to recognize, that when, when we try to consider... What, what kind of judgment we can render that we have to consider the heart. While we cannot judge the heart, what we can judge are outcomes. Matthew 7, here's the words of Christ. Starting in verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. This is one of the things that I have observed in my life that... <clears throat> I perceive myself and, and would, would expect others to kind of live an evidence-based perspective. You know, when we, we see so many bad political ideas being presented so often around us by our elected leadership, and it is as though the outcome of the plans has no bearing on continuing the plans. How many bad ideas do we have to see come to a bad end and yet no one changes course. By your fruits you shall know them. The same thing should be said about our faith too and, and in our congregations and in our conversation with others. The Lord is working with everyone individually, each and every one of you too, and He is revealing things through your study, through your life, through your path. And there is times that that sometimes we hear ideas of our faith that may, may sound a little odd, may not be attuned to our own perspectives. Do we immediately shut that down, or do we, do we stand back and say, well, let's look at the outcome of this? If we stand back and look at the outcome, 
There was a there was a, a wise member of the Sanhedrin in Christ's time named Gamaliel who said, maybe we should look at the outcome of this because if this is of God, we can't stop it. And so I think we need to be careful that we don't let our own our own preconceived ideas stand in the way of God revealing his truth to others too. It is consistent through Scripture that we are taught to look at the outcomes, not the individual element. Now granted, we have been we can see through Scripture sin is the transgression of God's law. We have God's law listed here. But there are matters that that aren't exactly black and white within those things that somebody may may bring to us in our faith that just may be a matter of practice, may be a matter of 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 an idea of interpretation. If anyone tells you to sin, you know right then that's not of God. There's there is no love in sin. It it is the opposite of love. So so we know that very clearly. What we can judge, though, is, is, is those outcomes, and the fruit of the Spirit is the outcomes we should be looking for. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I don't know that I got it all there, but it's Galatians 5.22 if you want to look. If that's the outcome, it's of God. A corrupt tree is not going to bear those fruits. Conversely, if somebody is screaming the name of, of, of Christ and, and all these things that sound biblical, but the outcome is strife, envy, pride, sedition, that's not of God. We should be, have a mind of discernment to recognize when something is, is of God and when it's not. And while we are not called to judge others at this time for their behavior or their salvation we are called to work it out with ourselves. We, we should be judging sin in our own lives. We should be lining up our lives against Christ. That's my point here, is to do everything I can to live like Jesus Christ. It's my duty to look in the mirror, to examine my life and say, where does it align with Christ? Am I walking with Him or away from Him? Would, would He be saying, well done, Keep going or get behind me, Satan. You're, you're off the rails. We need to give thoughts to those in our own minds. It is not our responsibility to do that for others. I can't stress that enough. The only responsibility for sin that we have in the lives of others is if they're way off base and we loving them don't say anything about it. Or if we entice them to sin, put a stumbling block in front of them, Romans 14, 13 says it would be better for a millstone to be hung about your neck than to cause a little one to falter. Or if we teach that sin is not sin, if we teach improperly, that's where we can be responsible for the sin in others' lives, and we will be held accountable for that. One of the, the things that we need to consider in this light is the standard by which we judge others. I mentioned before, we need to be very careful in how we apply our judgment towards others. And again, I'm going to go back here to, to Matthew 7, and, and we'll look in verse 3. Or actually start in verse, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. This second verse here should, should make us all tremble and quake in our shoes for every time we've given consideration to somebody and said, you know, they may not make it into God's kingdom. There is no more dangerous thing that you can say than to talk about the status of salvation of someone else. Because right here in verse 2 it says, For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why do you behold the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the beam that is in your own? We're going to be judged by how we judge others. That should cause a lot of weight when we consider how we talk about, how we talk to, how we minister, how we try to reach out to people that, that may have varying levels of experience with faith, may have, a, may have a, a blossoming relationship with Christ or none at all. I'm sure many of you remember the Westboro Baptist Church out of Topeka, Kansas. There's an entire motorcycle group that was created 
in response to them called the Patriot Guard. The Westboro Baptist Church during the early 2000s was fond to go and protest against American soldiers who had died afar off with, with terrible signs, just as, essentially as though they were the arbiters of what God's judgment was. And, and their favorite signs were God hates, fill in the lines. I pray for those people. I hope that God reaches them, and I hope that, that he does not hold those words against them because they love to tell everyone they're going to hell. Let it not come from your lips that anyone is not going to make it. That is a decision for the Lord alone to make. Sure, people live rough lives and, and may do things, and, and we can look at the outcomes. You and I are not responsible for making the decision about anyone else's salvation. And, it is, and, and if we put ourselves in Christ's shoes to do so, we are taking something upon ourselves we have no right to do. I spoke a couple weeks ago about Aaron and Moses and their issues. And as I was meditating on that message, you know, Aaron was right there standing at everyone and saying, let's throw our rings together and let's build this golden calf. And that wasn't a disqualifying measure from going to the promised land. What was disqualifying was when he and Moses went to the rock and said, must we bring this water from the rock? They put themselves in God's shoes, and that disqualified them from the promised land. If we are the ones that are, are, are saying that we are the arbiters of another's salvation, we're putting ourselves in God's shoes, and we have the example from Moses and Aaron, that if we do that, it is a dangerous place to be, because he can then decide that if we are measuring others that way, we too shall be measured the same. With that in mind, we should have a really expansive view of others' opportunity for salvation. Like I mentioned earlier, not willing that any should perish. So the major point I'm trying to make today, brethren, is that yes, we are living, living in this time. And yes, these are difficult, crazy times. I'm glad to have the hoary heads amongst us both here and, and elsewhere that, that can confirm that these times are out of control. Because many young people say, oh, it's, it's always been this nuts. But not according to everyone I've talked to that lived before me. <laughs> it's not always been this nuts. But while this is an interesting time, our mind should be focused on the end point and, and trying to not only be there, but to live in a way like we will live there. There will be no hurt. There will be no pain. There will be no sin. Are we focusing hard on living that life now? Because if we're not, what point is there in saying, you didn't even try, but here, go be a first fruit? No. We should be future-minded with our spiritual perspectives. We should be doing all we can to live purely and sinlessly now. Our flesh is what is holding us back and entices us to sin. But this dress rehearsal is about determining who will be the teachers and who will be those being taught. And he has called you and me to be teachers, not to be those just floundering through. With our calling, we can't pretend that we aren't being prepared to teach. Otherwise, we will not be the first fruits, the sons of God, changed to be his children. The final scriptures in 1 Peter 4. First Peter 4:17 The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, then what shall the end be of them who do not obey his gospel? This this is as close to the real thing as it can be. This is the dress rehearsal. This is the preparation. Judgment begins with the house of God. And remember, judgment's not always bad. God is looking out for us. He's looking for us to change our lives and with His Spirit to change the lives of others for His glory because the world needs as much light as it can in these dark times. I'm proud that the Lord has called me to stand with you, to be a part of this congregation, to be a part of His family. 
and look forward to that eternity with all of you. Say a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just thank you beyond measure for coming to us, for being a part of our lives, for showing us your son, for showing us our older brother, for teaching us that that we are a family and that you're growing your family and that we are a part of your family. Please strengthen us through the coming week. Be with us this afternoon with our time of fellowship. We love you. We worship you. We lift up the most holy name, Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, the Christ. We love him and look to his return as soon as possible according to your will. And it's in that name we pray. Amen.